Now, today we're going to be continuing on in the book of Matthew, and I want you to remember that last time we were in Matthew, this is last week, we learned that John the Baptist was that Elijah-like prophet who came to prepare the path straight for the Messiah. And so from that, we learned, of course, that Jesus of Nazareth must be the Messiah because John foretold of him. Now, this week, Jesus is going to call this generation into account as being those who always reject the prophets that God sends. We're going to learn today that this generation is really used for all unbelievers who live for all time, who demand that God jumps through their hoops, and who always rejects the revelation that God gives. That's what we're going to be learning today. So notice my title is a little unusual. Do we dance for Jesus or does Jesus dance for us? The point there is, are we going to be those who welcome the revelation that Jesus Christ gives? Will we dance to his tune? Or are we going to demand that God's revelation is somehow different, somehow more pad- palatable to our human sinful sensibilities? Are we going to make Jesus dance to our tune? That's really the question, as you're going to see, raised in this passage today. So with that, let's begin in verses 16 through 17. Here, Jesus is rebuking this generation for being those who always reject the prophets that are sent to them. Notice Jesus says, But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces who call out to the other children and say, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. Now, I want you to notice, first of all, that Jesus is going to make a comparison. He wants to compare this generation to something, and so he's going to be using a simile. And you can see the simile with the like, the homeos. Okay, but first of all, notice he's talking about this generation, and I put it in bold for a reason. What I'm going to be showing you in the application is that this generation is more than just merely people that live during the same time. It's actually about people who are of the same kind. And so the issue with this generation is it's people, no matter when they live, who always reject the prophets and the promises of God and therefore reside in unbelief. So we'll we'll talk more about that in our application, but make no mistake about it, this generation is characterized by unbelief. That's the point. So what does Jesus compare the unbelievers to? Well, notice he says they're like children. In fact, they're like children sitting in the marketplaces. Now, let me stop there for a moment. Why does Jesus mention the marketplaces? Well, in the ancient Near East, the center point of any given town would have been the marketplace. That's where the parents and the people would go to have trade. They would sell produce. They would buy produce. And as the parents would go to the marketplace, the center of the the town or the local village, their children would go. And as their children would go, they would, of course, play with the other children. That's just the way kids are. And so what this shows us, first of all, is that Jesus, the God-man, the second person, the Trinity, is a very keen observer of human affairs. He even pays attention to the little games that children play. And he uses it here in this comparison. Again, the the unbelieving generation are like children in these marketplaces, and notice what do they do? Who call out to the other children. Now stop there. What you're going to see is this calling out to the other children is a complaint. This generation is complaining about something. That's important for our interpretation of this passage. They're complaining. Notice they call out to the other children, and what do they say? Notice verse 17. It's very important, by the way, that Anne say. This is Legocene. I'll show you why that's important, because it ties to their complaint later in verses 18 through 19. Notice this is the complaint. We played the flute for you. Stop there. What kind of music would be played with the flute? Well, it would be a happy tune. It would be a tune that would bring joy. And so their complaint is that they played this flute to these other children, And what was the problem? Notice in the underline, you didn't dance. You didn't dance to the tune that we played. Now, notice the next complaint of this generation. We sang a dirge. 
Now, what's a dirge? Well, that would be a song associated with a funeral that called for mourning. So this is calling for sadness. The first one called for joy. This one calls for sadness. We sang a dirge, and what's the problem? This is their gripe. This is the complaint of this generation, and you did not mourn. Dear ones, the way I believe Jesus is framing this is notice here the first gripe that you see in red. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. That's directed towards John the Baptist. John the Baptist came not as the most joyful man. He wore camel hair. How joyful could you be? He ate locusts and honey. He called for repentance and mourning. Why? Preparing the path straight for the Messiah. And the point is, this unbelieving generation said, hey, we played the flute for you, John, but you didn't play along and dance. You're someone we don't want. But guess what? Jesus came, and here's a man who's very joyful. He's very joyful. He brings messianic salvation. He dines with sinners. And they say, hey, for this prophet of God, we sing a dirge. And you know what? We don't like him either because he didn't mourn. I think that that's what's going on here. The point is this generation doesn't like the prophets of God. They say to God, your prophets have to dance to our tune. We won't dance to yours. Now, let me just let you be aware that there are two possible interpretations to this section of scripture that we're going through. And I want to lay them both out and kind of argue for what I believe to be the case, as I've kind of laid out already. The first interpretation sees this generation as the flute players and the dirge singers. Okay, so the flute players play the happy tune, the dirge singers call for mourning. And the problem that they have, again, remember this generation are the unbelievers, the problem they have is with John and Jesus. Why? Because John didn't dance and Jesus didn't mourn. In other words, they don't like God's prophets. They won't take God's revelation on God's terms. They want a revelation that's more palatable to their sinful human sensibilities. That's the idea. Now, it is possible, however, to see John and Jesus as the flute player and the dirge singer. And the idea here would be this generation wouldn't play along. This generation wouldn't dance, and they wouldn't mourn. Okay, in fact, I have to admit, the vast majority of commentators today, at least, see it, the interpretation to be the second way that you see on the right side of the screen. Well, let me argue for the first interpretation. Why do I labor this? If you don't get the interpretation of the text right, you're out in left field. Okay, now, to be fair, either way that you get in this interpretation, you're probably going to come to the same ultimate result, but I think it's important. First of all, I want you to notice here the word order. The word order has to do with both John and Jesus, and it's preserved in the first interpretation. What do I mean by John and Jesus? John came first. John was the forerunner, not Jesus. It wasn't Jesus preparing the path for John. It was John preparing the path for Jesus. And so this interpretation preserves the order. Why? Well, because this generation played the flute, and it was John who came first who went dance. This generation played the dirge, and it was Jesus who went mourn. Now, go to the second interpretation. It's inverted. If John is, in fact, one of the players of the instruments... Well, he has to be the dirge singer. Even though he's first, he ends up doing the dirge singing second. Jesus, who comes second, plays the first tune. So the order is off. Now, let me show you another reason why I think the first interpretation is preferable. Turn your Bibles to this whole section. Matthew 11, let's look at verses 16 through 19 as a whole. Matthew 11, 16 through 19. Let's look at verse 16 again. Turn your Bibles open to Matthew eleven sixteen. What I'm going to show you is there's a connection between the complaint of this generation in verse 17 and their complaint in verses 18 through 19. I'll show you what I mean. Matthew eleven sixteen. Notice again, Jesus said, but what shall I compare this generation? Well, it's like children. And what are the children doing? Well, they're sitting in the marketplaces who call out to the other children. And notice in verse 17, and say. Stop there. Does everyone see the phrase and say? 
That's legosine in the Greek. It's actually a participle form here. And it just means to say. But what you're going to see is that same term is used in verse 18 and 19 for the complaint of this generation. And it shows us that indeed they have to be the flute players in the dirge singers. So again, what did this generation complain about in what they said, legusine? Well, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. I think implied is John and Jesus are like the children who wouldn't dance to their tune. Again, they said, we sang the dirge and you did not mourn. Now, we're going to come to verses 18 through 19 in the next slide, but let's read it here. For John came neither eating nor drinking. Stop there. What's the point? He didn't play their game. John didn't show joy the way they wanted. He was too serious. He was too holy. He eats locusts and honey. And so notice their complaint. Legosine. That ties you to the complaint of this generation up above. They say he has a demon. He has a demon. That's what they're saying. They're complaining. We don't like John. Notice verse 19. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. In other words, he was too joyful. And they say, Legosine. This is their complaint. Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, they didn't like him. So the complaint ties you to this generation, and it shows us that indeed, the, this generation were the flute players and the dirge singers, and they didn't like the fact that John and Jesus didn't dance and didn't mourn. That's the point. And so that's what we come to then in verses 18 through 19. Let's put it up on the screen. Jesus says, For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Again, dear ones, notice here, I'll pull up my pointer, John came neither eating nor drinking. He didn't live up to their expectation. He wasn't joyful enough. He was, in a, in a sense, you might say, as one scholar said, he's too holy. Right? So what's their complaint? Here it is. They say he has a demon. Do you know in the ancient Near East, they didn't believe in mental illness? They didn't believe in mental illness. If you were crazy, they said he has a demon. They think this guy's crazy. He has a demon. He wears camels here. He's preaching repentance all the time after us for our sin. And of course, they couldn't conceive of themselves being bad people. They were the people of Israel. And so it's obviously got to be John's fault. He must have a demon. Notice here, verse 19, the Son of Man. Remember, that's Jesus' favorite self-designation. What does Jesus call himself more often in the Gospels than any other phrase? He calls himself the Son of Man because it links you to the Messiah of Daniel 7 who will rule and reign over the world. So the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Legosine. What's their assessment? Well, he's too happy. He's not holy enough. Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. The point is, this generation wouldn't tolerate any prophet that God sent. Any prophet that God sent, they wouldn't listen. Why? Because this generation won't dance to the tune of Jesus. Jesus has to dance to their tune. But notice Jesus says at the end of verse 19, yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Now, that's also a tough interpretive section here. What does it mean, yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds? Do you know some scholars will claim that here wisdom is really referring to Jesus in the sense that Jesus is wisdom personified. And a case can be made for that. However, I would see wisdom is generically referring to God's wisdom in his salvific purposes of sending both John and Jesus. And so the idea is that the wisdom of sending John and Jesus is proven to be valid by what they do and by the results of their ministry, their righteousness and the salvific plan that they bring about. Let me show this to you. Let's focus on Jesus for a moment. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 1, verses 23 through 24. 
What I'm going to do is connect the wisdom of God's plan to the work of Christ. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 1, 23 through 24. It's a reminder of what Bob has taught us some months ago. 1 Corinthians 1, 23 through 24. Let me grab a drink here. I'm still struggling with my voice a little. But I laid off singing in the shower all week, so <laughs> it's coming along. Notice here in verse 23, Paul says, But we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness, but to those who are the called, this is the elect, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Jesus Christ is the expression of God's wisdom unto salvation. And I think that that's exactly the point here at the end of verse 19. God's wisdom and his salvific purposes in sending both John, the prophet like Elijah, and Jesus, the Messiah, in that order, that wisdom for salvation is vindicated by her deeds. The term deeds there, work, is ergon. I think that is synonymous uh, with the fruit that you see, for example, remember back in Matthew 7. Remember Jesus says you will know them by their fruit. And we define fruit as what? Both doctrine and deed. And I think the idea is that the wisdom of God sending John and Jesus is borne out in the fact that they bring about true righteousness, they bring about salvation, the forgiveness of sins. The evidence of their rightness is proven by the result of their ministry, bringing people the messianic salvation so that they can have a true righteousness and a forgiveness of sins and the absolute assurance of everlasting life. Brothers and sisters, what's very apparent in this passage is this generation, meaning unbelievers, they don't like God's revelation. They say to God, God, you dance to our tune. We won't dance to yours. What makes us believers in Jesus Christ is that has changed. We are the ones who say, Jesus, I'll dance to your tune. You don't have to dance to mine. That's the difference. Okay, now, let's come to some applications. And uh, although I have three of them for you, I'm only going to be covering two of them. I made an editorial decision by Friday where I realized I don't have enough time to get into all three. But the third one will come up very shortly again in Matthew 11. So we'll hit the first two. Number one, and by the way, number one is more of an exegetical issue. We should understand this generation is a quality of people who reject God's prophets, not merely a quantity of people living during a certain time. That's going to be very important as we approach the Olivet Discourse. If you don't understand how Jesus uses this generation, you're going to be out in left field. You're not going to understand what he's saying. Okay? Second point, we must receive, remember the receive means to warmly welcome, with faith is implied, God's revelation, whether or not it seems distasteful to us. We cannot be those who read something in Scripture and say, hey, you know what, I don't like that. Um, I, I think I understand what it's saying, but I don't like what it says. Therefore, because of my sensibilities, I'm not going to believe that. That's telling Jesus, you dance to my tune, I won't dance to yours. We can't be that people. We can't be. Why? Because we're called out of this generation. All right? Third, and I'll come to this later in Matthew 11, we must know that true righteousness far exceeds man-made rules of food, drink, and asceticism. I think that that's what a lot of the Jews were hung up on. How can they be the sinners? How can they be a problem? Why should they be called into repentance? After all, they wash their hands before they eat. And they had all these man-made scruples that fooled themselves into the fact that they thought they were truly righteous when they were not. But we'll come to that. Let's begin with number one. I want to help this church and the church at large better understand how Jesus uses the phrase, this generation. And again, it's going to come up as we go through Matthew. This is the first time today in Matthew eleven sixteen that Matthew has used that phrase, this generation. Now, Bob DeWay has written a very important article about this very phrase, and you can look it up, and I highly recommend everyone read this article. It's Critical Issues Commentary, Issue 77. And if I were to summarize Bob's excellent writing on this generation, this is a phrase that summarizes the whole article. This generation is primarily, not exclusively, but primarily about, about 
people of the same kind, not people just living during the same time. That's from Bob Dewey. I'm citing Bob Dewey. So let me, let me say that again. This generation is primarily about people of the same kind, not merely people who live during the same time. It ends up being a pejorative. Let me show you why this is important. First of all, what I'm claiming is most people see this generation as a reference to quantity. It's people alive during a certain time period. So normally people will see a generation as 40 to 80 years. And so the idea that people have is when Jesus talks about this generation, he's just referring to people who are alive during the 40 to 80 years of his earthly ministry. What I'm going to show you is that's not really a good understanding a full understanding of this generation. It's really more about quality. That has to do with people characterized by lack of belief no matter when they lived. If you live during the time of Cain and Abel and you're an unbelief, you're part of this generation. If you live in Jesus' day and you reject the prophets of God, you're part of this generation. If you live today and you say, Jesus, you dance to my tune, I won't dance to yours. I won't receive that revelation. You're part of this generation. It's a kind of people, not a time of people. All right, now, let me show you why this is important. Notice Jesus said in Matthew eleven sixteen 16 today, but to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces who call out to the other children. And remember, what was the complaint? Hey, we played the flute God's prophet John didn't dance. We sang the dirge, and the Messiah that God sent, he wouldn't mourn. And so notice here, the assessment of this generation is negative, and it's purely negative. They're the ones who won't receive the prophets of God. So let's ask ourselves, if this generation is merely about a time period, can it be said that every single Jew living in Jesus' day is an unbeliever. Well, of course not. Think about it. in Luke chapter 2, you have righteous Simeon who prophesies of messianic salvation. He had come out of this generation. He was no longer part of it. Think about the disciples, all of them except Judas by faith in Christ, came out of this generation. They weren't part of it. Think about Martha and Mary Magdalene and uh, think about Joseph of Arimathea and others that you know that came to faith. They're not part of this generation. So what you start seeing is that this generation is more about a quality of people. It doesn't matter when you live. What matters is if you have faith. If you have faith, you are no longer part of this generation. Now, let me show you some other cases. Bob and I understand this generation prior, primarily to be a pejorative. So Jesus uses it in connection with those who are in corporate solidarity with those who reject the prophets and the promises and hate God's revelation no matter what time they lived. A good example of this is found in Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, remember the scribes and the Pharisees, they think it's not sufficient that Jesus fulfills all of the messianic prophecies. That's not good enough. No, they're going to demand a sign. Jesus, you give us a sign. Then we'll believe you're the Messiah. Notice how Jesus responds. It says, but he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. But first of all, I want to point out, notice the adjectives associated with this generation. It's evil and adulterous. Okay, that's a moral assessment. Again, in the moral assessment, it has to do with quality, the kind of person, not the quantity. The issue isn't when you lived, it's the type of people they are. That's the issue. Now again, would we say that every single Jew living in Jesus' day was evil and adulterous? No, there were many who came to faith. Now, notice Jesus says that this evil and adulterous generation, meaning unbelievers, they always crave a sign, but none will be given to it except what? The sign of Jonah the prophet. What is that a sign of? Well, that's the resurrection. The idea is there's a parallel between Jonah the prophet who was sent to the Ninevites. For all intents and purposes, he was dead for three days in the belly of the sea creature, yet he lived. Jesus, the Messiah, literally was dead in the ground three days, and yet he lived Why he was raised from the dead. So what Jesus is saying is the only sign that will ever be given to this evil and adulterous generation 
is the sign of the resurrection. Let me ask you that. Is that true just for 40 to 80 years around Jesus' ministry? Is that true for only the next 40 to 80 years? And then after that, he'll start giving signs? Is that how you understand that? I don't think so. I think that that's going to be the way it is throughout the entire church age. That there will be no sign given to this generation except the resurrection. And how do you know about the resurrection? Did you and I see it? No, we know about it through God's revelation. But what does this generation do with this revelation? They don't like it. They don't like it. That's what we learned today. That's the point of Matthew 11, 16 through 19. They say, when God gave us the revelation, we didn't like it because Jesus has to dance to our tune. We won't dance to his. If you don't believe, as Jesus says in Luke 16, 31, in the Law and the Prophets, neither will you believe even if someone is raised from the dead. The only sign that will ever be given until the Lord returns in the rapture is the resurrection. Don't fool yourself. All of the other signs when we get to the Olivet Discourse, they're all in the 70th week of Daniel. How do I know that so boldly, confidently? Because Jesus says in Matthew 24, 15, so when you see the abomination that causes desolation, well, that's not during the church age. That's the 70th week of Daniel, and so it is that all the signs that Jesus gives are in that time period. But for everyone living during the church age, not one sign. You'll never be given a single sign to tip you off, and that's what leads to imminence. We always have to be prepared for the moment we breathe our last or the Lord Jesus comes. Dear ones, that's clearly cross-generational as far as time. Clearly. Okay, let me give you another example. Remember in Matthew 17, Peter, James, and John, they were up on the mountain, probably on cloud nine in our vernacular, because they were with Jesus as he was transfigured in a foreshadowing of the parousia. But they come down from the mountain, and they fail immediately. Why? Because they're to cast out a demon from a demon-possessed man, and they fail because of a lack of faith. They start trusting in their own power rather than the power of God. And so notice Jesus' assessment in Matthew 17, 17. It says, Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. Notice Jesus' assessment certainly is directed towards the disciples. It's probably beyond that. But it certainly incorporates them. And what does he call them? An unbelieving and perverted generation. Here, Jesus is using biting irony. Remember Bob taught us some months ago that the apostle Paul used this kind of biting irony in 1 Corinthians 3. If you're a note taker, jot down 1 Corinthians 3.3. 3. 1 Corinthians 3.3. 3. The reason you want to jot that down is remember Paul said of the believing Corinthians, he said, you're fleshly, sarkikos. Now why did he say of believers that are in the spirit that they were fleshly? Well, he was using biting irony. He was saying, hey, you are in the spirit, but you're acting like you're still in the flesh. That's the point of Jesus' rebuke of the disciples. They have come out of this generation. They are believing, but they're acting like they're still in it. That's part of the biting irony. So, dear ones, think about an unbelieving and perverted generation. How do you flee from that? How do you leave it? Let's ask ourselves that. Is it by being born at a different time? Or is it by coming to faith in Jesus Christ? Is it by having faith? Now, let me show you another example. Turn your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew 23, 34 through 36. Matthew 23, verses 34 through 36. Now, as you're turning there, I just realized I didn't turn on my timer. <laughs> so you may be here till 1 o'clock. I have no idea. Matthew 23, 34 through 36. Now, the reason I want you to turn there is because here you will see the idea of corporate solidarity. The idea is not when you live. The idea of this generation is that you have the same unbelief that characterizes people of any age, in any age they live. And that becomes very apparent here as Jesus is excoriating the leadership of Israel in their temple. Notice here in Matthew 23, 34 to 36, Jesus says, Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets, and wise men, and scribes, 
Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. Stop there for just a moment. That's the point of today in Matthew 11, 16 through 19. God sent John. What happened to John? Beheaded. God sends Jesus. What happens to him? Crucified. They don't like the prophets. Why? Because they say, God, you dance to our tune. We won't dance to yours. That's the point. Notice verse 35. He says, So that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Stop there. Notice there in verse 35, Jesus talking about all the shed blood from the time of Cain and Abel. When was that? Well, that's the beginning of time. Those were Adam and Eve's children. Well, when was Zechariah, son of Berechiah, murdered? Well, that's thousands of years later. But notice here, when it comes to Zechariah, son of Berechiah, notice the phrase, Jesus says, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Wait a minute. Jesus is saying this in 33 AD. Is he claiming that these Pharisees and these scribes lived 500 years earlier? No, he's linking them in solidarity with others who went before who had the same unbelief and the same hatred of God's prophets. Why? Because they're all part of this generation. Notice verse 36. He says, Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Brothers and sisters, this generation isn't about a time period. It's about a kind of people, no matter when they live, who hate the prophets of God and tell God, you, don't, you dance to my tune, I won't dance to yours. I won't have you turn to this, but jot this down, if you would, Acts 2.40. Acts 2.40 is important because there, Peter, after Pentecost, says literally, be saved from this perverse generation. Is Peter saying, hey, to be saved from this generation, you can't live now. You can't live now. Is that what he's saying? Or is he saying, you better come to faith and not be like that kind of people? Well, of course it's the latter. Of course it is. Dear ones, think about this today. Jesus taught that this generation are like kids who say, we won't dance to your tune, God. You dance to ours. And what we have to know is that the only way to flee from this generation is not by being born at a different time. It's by being born again. How, do you, how are you going to get out of this generation? By wishing, hey, I, I wish I was born back in 1941. Things were better then. I liked uh, radial engines and I liked P40s and I think that's so cool. I w wish I was born then. You're still part of this generation if you're an unbeliever. Again, the only way to flee this generation is not by being born at a different time. It's by being born again. That's what we need. Dear ones, this generation is clearly a pejorative about a kind of people, not merely the time they live. Now, my second point today is really the main point of this passage, and it's the question, will we submit to God's revelation or will we make God's revelation submit to us? That's really the question. Think about it. This generation is comprised of all unbelievers who say to the prophets of God, we won't listen to you. We don't approve of the revelation that God gives because it offends our sinful sensibilities. Let me give you some historical examples. Think about Jeremiah in his day. He calls the people of Judah to repentance, that they are to turn from their idolatry and turn back to Yahweh. Otherwise, God is going to smite them by using the Chaldeans. And yet, instead of listening to the true prophet of God, they come up with their own false prophets who tell them, peace, peace, when there was no peace. Jeremiah 6.14. Uh, turn your Bibles, if you will, to Jeremiah 26, verses 3 through 6. Again, Jeremiah 26, verses 3 through 6. Very apropos for what we learned today in Matthew 11. Jeremiah 26 Verses 3 through 6. Here's the Lord. He's speaking through Jeremiah. And the Lord says, Perhaps they will listen, and everyone will turn from his evil way, that I may repent of the calamity which I am planning to do to them because of the evil of their deeds. And you will say to them, Thus says the Lord, If you will not listen to me, 
to walk in my law, which I have said before you, notice verse 5, to listen to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I have been sending to you again and again, but you have not listened. Stop there. That's exactly the point. In Jesus' day, God sent John and Jesus, and they wouldn't listen. John and Jesus have to dance to their tune. They won't dance to his. It's the same issue. Verse 6, then I will make the house like Shiloh. Shiloh was utterly destroyed. In this city, that's Jerusalem, I will make a curse to all the nations of the earth. Dear ones, do you know how that generation responded to Jeremiah? Well, they threw him in a cistern. They threw him in a cistern. In fact, in Jeremiah, later on, Jeremiah calls everyone in the city of Jerusalem to not stand and fight because God had revealed that they would all die by the sword. They were to go out to the Chaldeans and be led away. Why? Because that was God's providential plan and his revealed plan through Jeremiah the prophet. But they wouldn't listen. And the king's men, Zedekiah's king's men, they were angry. Why? Because here you have Jeremiah saying, hey, go out to the Chaldeans, give up the post. And they thought that that was seditious. After all, what soldier is going to keep fighting when the prophet of God is saying, hey, put down your arms and go to be with the Chaldeans. And so here you have an Ethiopian eunuch. Think about it. eunuch as someone who's castrated. You can't be any more cursed and far off from God than an Ethiopian eunuch. And yet he has greater wisdom than anyone else in Israel. Notice here in Jeremiah 38, 9, the eunuch says to King Zedekiah, my lord the king, these men have acted wickedly in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast into the cistern. Dear one, what happened to the true prophet of God? Was there a great revival? Was everyone saying, you know what, we should all do what Jeremiah says and our nation's going to be grand? No, they threw him in a muddy cistern to die. What happened to John the Baptist? He's beheaded. What happened to Jesus? He's crucified. Why? Because this generation says, God, you dance to our tune. We won't dance to yours. Let me fast forward to give you another instance. Think about in Jesus' day, he is the prophet par excellence. He is the God-man. He's God himself who comes on the scene of history. And in John chapter 6, he is the bread of life. Remember, Jesus, as the second person of the Trinity, is Yahweh. And he was the one who fed the people, the Israelites, in the wilderness with manna from heaven. So in John chapter 6, he presents himself as the bread that came down from heaven. And if we will eat of his flesh and drink of his blood, which is just a metaphorical way of saying, if you'll believe in me, I'll give you eternal life. But Jesus knows that the vast majority of the Jews want a Messiah who gives them bread to eat, but who doesn't come to take away their sins. So in John 6, 44, he assesses the spiritual condition of mankind. And he says, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. And they're offended by that. In fact, later in John 6, 65 to 66, notice what it says. It says, and he was saying, for this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. Now, let's take this bit by bit. I'll stop there for just a moment. No one can. This is universal. Not a single human being has the ability to what? To come to Jesus. Now, that phrase earlier in John 6 means it's synonymous with coming to faith. So come to me means to come to faith. So make no mistake about it. What Jesus is saying is no human being has the ability to come to faith in me unless what? Unless it's been granted him from the Father. Salvation is purely a monergistic work of God. Purely. What does it monergistic mean? It means one. It's an act of one. It's God. It's his will. It's his sovereign choice. It's not a synergistic work where man cooperates. No, it's purely of God. It's purely of God. Well, what did that do to those that were around him? Well, notice verse 66 says, as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. What they said is, we don't like that. God, your revelation is distasteful to my sinful sensibilities. And so, God, I'm not going to dance to your tune. 
you're going to have to dance to mine. That's what they were saying. Dear ones, how many in here have seen the debate between James White and Leighton Flowers? It was about six weeks ago, I believe, or five weeks ago. I actually watched this debate. It's on John 6, 44. And I watched the debate while I had COVID. I had nothing better to do, lots of time in my hands, so I watched this debate. And by the way, it was good. James White believes this text says exactly, I should say it means exactly what it says. That God is completely sovereign in salvation, and he clearly won the debate. I want every single person, if you get an opportunity, watch that debate. Because James White sticks with the text of John 6, 44 and 45, but Leighton Flowers doesn't like it. And so he goes all over the place with red herrings during the debate. What about infant damnation? And James White says, is that the debate? Is that what the debate is about, or is it about John 6, 44 and 45, which you can't handle? At one point in the debate, I took it word for word, at an hour and 42 minutes, Leighton Flowers said this, Remember, the debate was about John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father draws him. Leighton Flowers said, this debate isn't about who can exegete the text in a way that Dr. White approves. It is a debate about Jesus' supposedly inconceivable teaching of unconditional election, unquote. Leighton Flowers says it is un it's inconceivable to his human sensibilities that God alone saves. It's inconceivable. Why? Because the revelation of God offends him. And what he's really saying is, God, I'm not going to dance to your tune. You dance to mine. And so the challenge to every one of us out there, as we go out the door, in any given text that we come across, are we going to bow the knee to the meaning of the text? Or are we going to try to make the text bow its knee to us. For many years, I've had to change so many positions in my life as I grew as a Christian when I realized they were unbiblical. Do you know in the 1990s, I was an airline pilot, and I was wrestling with this doctrine, and I had a man who was a captain that I flew with. His name was Jay Substad. I'll never forget him. And he challenged me on the doctrine of election. And as I went through the data of the scriptures, I had to realize, hey, I have to bow my knee to what it says. That's exactly what it says. It's exactly what it says, that God alone saves. Brothers and sisters, think about this. I'll give you another example. Some months ago, I was debating a man online, and I was showing him from Luke 17 that the people of God are promised exemption from the wrath of God. We will not be there when God's wrath was poured out. And, he, and I gave him passage after passage, and he said, oh, I, I don't believe it. I think we're going to go through the wrath. So I cited Luke 17, 29 through 30, where Jesus uses Lot. Remember, Noah was removed in the ark, then the wrath came. Then Jesus uses Lot, and he literally says, on the day that Lot came out of Sodom, the wrath came, the brimstone. And Jesus literally says in verse 30 of Luke 17, it will be the same way the day the Son of Man is revealed. So, What's the precedent in Scripture? The people of God are removed. Then the wrath comes. That's going to be the way it is when the Son of Man is revealed. He said, nope, we have to go through it. At some point, is this man simply saying, Lord, I won't dance to your tune. You dance to mine. Again, we can all be confused, and we can all maybe agree to disagree on things because we honestly have a difference of opinion. But at some point, when it comes to the doctrines of the faith, are we just simply saying to God, I don't like it. I don't like what your word says. And therefore, I won't acquiesce to it. That's the challenge for us today. Let us be those who are willing to bow the knee to whatever the scriptures reveal. I've had to do it. Bob's had to do it. The elders have had to do it. Adam's done it. We all have to do it. No matter where you are in your walk, the first part is to say, Lord, I dance to your tune. You don't have to dance to mine. That's what this passage teaches us here today in Matthew chapter 11. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you that your word is clear. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us clear instruction as to how to be saved from this 
adulterous and perverted generation, that it's through faith alone, in Christ alone, all by your grace alone, revealed in the scriptures alone, and that it's all to your glory, Lord. We thank you for these things. I do pray in the weeks, months, and years ahead that we would be a people dedicated to bowing our knee and dancing to the tune of Jesus rather than to try to demand that he dances to ours. We do pray, Heavenly Father, for the situation with Amnion. We do pray, Lord, that that ministry would turn from having a wayward gospel. We do pray also that we build a partner with others to save babies, but also, even more importantly, to save souls. I pray for my brothers and sisters as we go out the door that we'd be those who long to give your word, that we'd have boldness to preach your gospel so that others may be saved. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.